GamerCast Network. Hey! Alright. It's a video game show. It's a video game show. It's not a game show about videos. It's a video game show. Welcome to the GamerCast Network Video Game Show, episode number 91 for Sunday, May 25th, 2008. I'm Chad, and this week for the roll call, a listener submitted question from Tom. Not our Tom, but another Tom. Who was your first game girl crush? What? First video game girl that you said, damn, I'd like to hit it. Yes. Wow, that's tough. See, I'm actually going off of cover art is what I'm trying to remember because Game Chicks really didn't even get good until recently. Yeah, I mean, like, even when you were a little kid, I mean, it wasn't even until Super Nintendo until they even looked kind of human-like. Actually, I have my answer. I've thought of it now. Okay, so we've thought of some answers. And joining us this evening is Keith. Okay, I'm going to say the chick from the cover of Curse of the Azur Bonds. This is one of the old uh, gold box role-playing games. And her breasts were prevalent. With a sword and chain mail. I remember that's the first, like, real boobs I remember seeing on a game. There was one for the Amiga, but I don't remember what game it was. It might have been Conan the Sumerian or something. You could be a chick. She had a basketballs for boobs and a basketball for an ass because it was a side scroller. <laughs> she nice. couldn't squeeze through tight places. So let's just put it that way. Because she was as wide as Conan due to her ass and boobs. And also joining us this evening is Ivan. Uh, I have to go with Chun Li with her high kicks. And yeah, when you knock her out in her panty show. And it immediately goes to the Dirty Old Man show. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, I mean, this is the question. That's what it was asked. It's, <laughs> it's not our fault. And also joining us is Tom. Uh, I think this is very telling of my psychology. I don't know what this actually says, but the first chick in-game that I ever thought, wow, that chick's really cute, was uh, the chick I created in City of Villains. Because you use their character creator, and I kept like putting on like pleated skirt. I like pleated skirts. I'll put that on her. Your the chick was chick pretty hot, mine. dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gave her the little pony ponytails and the pleated skirt and the white blouse. Oh, jeez. Well, with me and my love of old Sierra Adventure games, I'm probably going to have to go with the uh, sluts from Leisure Suit Larry. Well, that'll do it. Yeah? That'll do it, yeah. I played that at a very young age. And look what it did to you. Yes. That's what it did. That's what it was. You know what another good one is? Is uh, the strippers in uh, Duke Nukem. Yeah. Yeah? How about that big head with the eye from Doom? The Kecko Demon? <laughs> It's a joke. Well, it does have a big mouth. I mean, oh, no, 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 no. That teeth, though. We're moving on. We're moving on. This week on the GamerCast Network. It's Banner Week on Uncle Gamer, as Jay and Paris bring you their first live show, recording in front of an audience and taking call-in questions. Let's get ready to rumble. This week, Gamer Tag Radio, episode number 147. The staff interviews Denby Grace, the producer of Don King Presents Prize Fighter. Coming out this June for the Xbox 360, Wii, and Nintendo DS. Be sure to get all the facts on the post game report. On Sarcastic Gamer, how could Grand Theft Auto 4 possibly get any better? And Cliffy B, one of the masterminds behind Gears of War, wants to change his name to Cliff. What's up with that? <laughs> Discover the podcast community that brings you all these great podcasts and more. GamerCastNetwork.com Next topic. Ivan, did you play anything this week? Oh, uh, yeah, I played Penny Arcade. Ah, yes. This is the PC and Xbox Live Arcade game that came out last week. Didn't it have a really long title? Penny Arcade Adventures on the Rain Slick Precipice of Darkness Episode 1. It's a mix of a uh, point-and-click adventure kind of thing and a Japanese role-playing game. The monsters attack, and it's very role-playing game-ish in that you have to pick who you're attacking and then pick your spell or ability, and then you kind of go in turn, with the only difference being is that it's more real-time, so you can't sit there and fart around for an hour picking your spells. Yeah, more like Final Fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. There's tons of humor. It starts off with gigantic fruit <laughs> smashing your house with 
Gabe and Tycho in tow chasing it. You're in the middle of raking your leaves, so you decide to uh, chase after the three of them, and you finally catch up with Gabe and Tycho with your rake and tell them that you're going to help figure out this whole robot thing because he smooshed your house. So for the first part of the game, your only weapon is a rake. Is the humor actually like Penny Arcade funny, or is it like kind of weak? No, it's identical to uh, Penny Arcade humor. Tycho, the whole time he's reading a book, so even in combat, he's reading a book and has a Tommy gun, so when it's his turn to attack, he throws the book up in the air, shoots his Tommy gun, and then catches the book and continues reading. Would people who aren't fans of Penny Arcade like this game? If you don't like Penny Arcade, you would have to like the Japanese role-playing game style. A good example is Chris, who can't stand those kinds of games, but you know, as far as I know, thinks Penny Arcade is very humorous. I don't think he would enjoy the game. So you have to be... At least one or the other into those kind of games or really, really, really love Penny Arcade. You know, you're the kind of guy who hangs out in the forums, buys their t-shirts, goes to PAX just to Be hopefully them. see them. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Me, I'm kind of in the middle of the road. I enjoy Penny Arcade. I enjoy the humor. I have played those kinds of games before, so it's not the best game I've ever played, but it's a good game. How long is this game? Did you just play the demo or did you play the whole thing? Assumed it was going to be pretty good, so I just went ahead and bought it. I played it for a few hours. I got through several sections. This is the first game at the new maximum price point for Xbox Live Arcade games of 1,600 points. Is it worth it? Uh, 1,600 points is what? I think it's 20 bucks. That's a lot for what the game is. The only good news is hopefully, since it's supposed to be quote-unquote episodic, hopefully like episode 2 isn't also 20 bucks. Hopefully if you have the game, future add-ons or downloadable content are hopefully cheaper, because 20 bucks is a lot to swallow for the game. Maybe not. Maybe it's a good 20 plus hour adventure i don't know look at it from a uh if it was a ds game absolutely i'm not okay. saying yeah. yeah well yeah, yeah. if you look at it from that standpoint a ds game is what 30 bucks so far you'd say if you like enjoy those kind of games it's worth the 20 bucks mm -hmm. next topic i know last week i had mentioned that i played a wii game called boom blocks yes and you enjoyed it thoroughly yeah it didn't make it into the show last week i really didn't talk much about it but i had been playing for the last couple of weeks over a friend's house the steven spielberg boom blocks game and i really liked it a lot and i said that if i ever buy a wii the first game i'm gonna buy is boom blocks did you, did you buy, buy a wii? wii yeah i got a wii <laughs> buy boom blocks and the first game i bought was boom blocks yeah it's a fun game a friend of mine on the forums avi and i wrote up a quick little review of boom blocks for the forums i'll put a link in the show notes it really is a great game. Took me back to my youth of knocking things over. Doesn't have to be youth, my friend. You can still do <laughs> such things. But you get in more trouble for it nowadays. Now Are you going to get a Wii Fit Pet? No, not buying a damn Wii Fit Pet. I'm not buying a scale. I saw they're running commercials pretty heavily this week for the Wii Fit. It amazes me, too, how like the media all loves Wii Fit. It's not a game, it's a scale. And actually, it's gotten Nintendo in some trouble over in Europe because it called some young girls obese who actually weren't obese. Oh god, if they're calling European girls fat, what do they say American girls are? Well, dude, I mean, in complete honesty, even when I was in my football playing shape, I was 267, but I was in good shape. And I was supposed to weigh 180 pounds. And anything over 180 pounds was considered obese. Yeah, this all has to do with the uh, BMI, which is the body mass index, which is a calculation determining if you're obese based off of just your weight and height not your body frame or structure. It's basically all just averages. Yeah, it's just so ridiculous that they really do need, not saying that they need to update it to make, you know, Jabba the Hutt be okay in it with his weight, but they do need to update that somewhat. The problem is it's all based on averages, and if you're over six foot, you're already well outside the average of American male height. So how they can say you're supposed to be six foot one and 180 pounds, I... If you're just a big framed person in shape, you're not obese. They really need to update that whole thing. But I'm curious, how is Nintendo getting slack for that? The system called these girls who were 10, 11 years old based on their BMI. It said you're obese. And that kind of shattered their own mental image of themselves and that whole deal. Well, you know what? Get used to it, because that's life. Well, yeah, the little girls were just like, since the machine told them they were obese, now they think they're obese. Yeah, that's the you problem. Know? You tell a 12-year-old girl she's obese, that's not a good way to start off your early teenage years. 
Well, dude, I guess we found out how to take over the world. Start young and have a computer tell them something. Yes. Next topic. For right now, for the Wii Fit, for those that don't know, the training it has you do really isn't cardiovascular. It has you do yoga, stretching, and those kind of things. Apparently, EA... It's going to weigh your wallet each week, and you have to take money out and put it into the box, and... You'll your lose wallet weight. is extremely obese and needs to be lightened. No, uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, this is from Peter Moore, and he's saying that EA Sports, their new uh, label, which is the EA Freestyle, it replaces the EA Big games, the over-the-top games. They're planning on bringing out a game for Wii Fit. It's going to be strenuous cardio kind of workouts. Oh, I can't wait for the first fat little bastard to have a heart attack. Because that's going to be hysterical. <laughs> Lawsuits everywhere. Chunk from Goonies is just going to have going to Carter Act arrest. And the idea is they want to focus on strenuous fun. They want to make the game so it doesn't feel like a workout. Think of you're running five miles. That's kind of a boring kind of workout. But if you play soccer for 90 minutes, you're probably still getting the same workout. So they want to try and have that kind of a fun workout oh, program. So Go play soccer if you want to play soccer. I will say, though, Wii Fit is selling out all over the place. Lots of people are onto it. Literally. It's gimmicky and fashionable. And they'll put it away in two weeks and never pick it up again. Exactly. Next topic. So let's do the other topic of the week which is the information that came out about Xbox Live Arcade. So there was an interview with Xbox Live's Mark Witten. They're going to start delisting Xbox Live Arcade games. And the eligibility for being delisted was that the title has to be more than six months old, has to have a conversion rate of less than 6%. I'm assuming that means the demo to full version conversion. Finally, the game has to have a Metacritic score of less than 65%. If it meets all those requirements and they choose to delist this game, they say to the company, hey, your game's only going to be on Xbox Live Arcade for another three months, and then we're taking it off. All right, I have a question. What happens then if you have the game and something goes wrong where your hard drive gets f I'm assuming this delisting is just from the marketplace. You can probably still re-download it. That was going to be my thing, because if I paid money for it, you can't yank it off without me a chance to get it back. How do you do that, though? You know, if it breaks, where would you go to re-download it? If you go to the Marketplace window, you can go to your download history. Does that keep a history since the beginning of since your Xbox? Since the beginning of your username. What do you think of them taking away games from Xbox Live Arcade, based on Metacritic information as well as other statistics? The big controversy I've heard everywhere is, why the hell would you ever tell people that they're going to use a Metacritic score when Metacritic is like Wikipedia and anybody can give anything, any score they want. I have a Metacritic question. I thought that Metacritic was based on reviewers from established websites. So this isn't user input. One I thought is, it was users and reviewers. I thought it was both. Yeah, but those were two separate scores. So you have the reviewer score, which is the one that's taken officially. And then there's the user score. Hey, I thought it was a weighted separate. average, or is it not? Well, even if it was just websites and magazines, I don't know that I would trust them to pick which games I want. I, I don't trust I mean, them. They're people saying we Fit is awesome. Right. And they're also people who've said that some of the good games that I like are absolute trash, and some games that are absolute trash are really good. All right, hold on. I'm about to read up on Metacritic on wikipedia see now right. doubly damned yourself right there <laughs> hey two wrongs sometimes make a right so he might have correct information i don't understand why they're delisting things to begin with yeah that's the ultimate question is why so i've heard some things that they're trying to clean up the list because the list is too long and people can't find stuff it is kind is... of a pain in the ass especially if you're just kind of putzing around because every now and then i'll just go download a handful of demos and uh it is kind of a pain in the rectum the other issue is that people have been vocal recently that there is not a lot of quality on Xbox Live Arcade. The N Plus developers are very critical of a lot of the recent content on Xbox Live Arcade, saying most of it's really just trash. It's a lot of the same stuff. How many times can you play the same game over and over and over again? Part of the response here from Microsoft was that they're going to be focusing on quality over quantity, but I still don't understand if you're going to be doing that from now on, why you're taking away in the back. Yeah, I mean, I'll be the first one to say that I won't miss Joust if it gets delisted. But you know what? There's some 45-year-old guy who remembers playing Joust is a teenager in the arcade and gets a 360 for whatever reason and would love to play it again. Even the crappy games somebody has bought and enjoyed. 
if we're assuming they're going to do what we think they're going to do, which is people who have bought the game will still be able to download it if there's an issue, that means that it's still living on a server somewhere for those people to download, which means literally all you're doing is removing it from view for people to download, which to me means that they're delisting it to try and improve either the interface which is a bad way to do it, or they want to show God knows who that they only have the best of the best games. If you had a blemish or a black mark on your thing by putting Yaris out, it's still out there. Why take it away? Right. It's there. We'll leave it. Somebody's going to play it. I was reading our forum thread on this, and a lot of people brought up a lot of good points. Somebody mentioned, why not just continue to discount the crappy games? Yaris was free, and I don't know if it's still free. I'm assuming it is. But say they started it off at, you know, 10 bucks, and then make it 5 bucks when it doesn't sell, and then eventually get to a point where you make it 50 Microsoft points or 10 Microsoft points or something. Somebody will buy it at 10 Microsoft points. I can guarantee you that. By the way, Metacritic, they do use a weighted score, but it's weighted among publishers. So if you're like PC Gamer Magazine, your score means more than Joe's blog. Okay, but I mean, it is still weighted. It's not a huge deal if someone just gets a stick up their bum and wants to go try to ruin somebody. Next topic. The other major announcement for Xbox Live Arcade had to do with the price point. They're now raising the bar for the maximum price of a game for Xbox Live Arcade to 1600 points or $20. It had been 1200 points or $15. The only problem I have with the price increase is jackholes like EA who charge a premium for their games because they're under this false impression that their games are worth more because they developed or published them. A good example was back when I had a PSP, the Rise of the Imperfects game, which was anything but imperfect, was $10 more than every no, other actually, PSP it was game. It was imperfect. It was anything but perfect. All right. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> well, you just said that it was I know. It was perfect. Anyway, the point is, is that because it was an EA published and or developed game, it was $10 more than, you know, every other game. So I don't mind 1,600 point games if they're worth 1,600 points. I'm afraid that at 1,600 points, that's going to be the limit. And some jackhole is going to take advantage of that, even though it's not worth 20 bucks. <clears throat> EA. You can bet your bottom dollar that people are going to just go, oh, they're charging more money and they're all going to raise their prices. But the sad part is, is people will bitch but probably still pay, in which case then 1,600 points will just be the new bar. Kind of like how we look at gas now and go, oh, wow, sweet, it's only 370 here. That's the problem. So right now, it's like... Five and ten dollar games, and the tiny little crappy ones are five dollars, and your mainstream ones are ten bucks. And then every once in a while, you'll get a fifteen dollar game like Puzzle Quest or something that's you know big in scope. And now I'm afraid it's going to wind up being ten and twenty dollar games for no good reason other than they have raised the price point. If people pay, they will do it. Next topic: the guy who voiced Nico from Grand Theft Auto 4. The actor's name was Michael Hollick. And he's basically a struggling actor who was doing work in theater, soap operas, bit roles on TV shows, yada, yada, yada. When he did the work on Grand Theft Auto 4, he was paid $100,000 for about 15 months voice acting, and he also did some motion capture. Sounds reasonable to me. Yeah. The problem is Grand Theft Auto 4 is part of this whole electronic media thing. So the normal royalties and residuals that actors are paid for TV programs or more traditional record performances, you don't get those from things like games. Damn right, because the residuals should go to the people who actually work hard, like the programmers. Well, so basically, Mr. Hollick here has only made $100,000 on Grand Theft Auto 4. Only. He's only made 100 Okay, I just want to make sure that, that we're on the same page. I know, tough that's just he's Jesus only Christ, made a hundred thousand dollars for talking into a microphone. You okay. had no real contribution to this game. Anyone could be a voice whoa, whoa, actor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He also did motion capture. He put a suit on with some little and, dots. and moved around. Okay. Moved around. That's what That's he did. Fine. But you know who did the real work behind that motion capture? Were the engineers behind that? Damn union actors. Well, here, here's the thing. If Grand Theft Auto 4 had been a TV show and made millions and millions of dollars, he would have seen a piece of that. Tough bitch. Knew that going in. 
You know what? I was about to say, they give you a contract. I'm agreeing to do this for X. And I don't understand why all these people get off saying, I'm worth more, I deserve more, when they already signed a contract for something. If you thought you were worth more and deserved more, why'd you sign the contract? Yeah, I think the key thing here is that he was a struggling actor. So $100,000 should have been the best news he could have asked for. A hundred grand could last you. I don't know where he's living, but a hundred grand is going to go pretty far unless you're spending it on hookers and blow. So is he suing? What, what? I just realized we all tore into him and we didn't even hear what he did or said yet. I don't want to know what, his, what he has to say. F that guy. F him. All he's saying is he's a little bummed because the game is really taking off and he's not seeing any of that pie. Alright, I can understand where he's coming from, but that's life, man. You signed the contract. I mean, you should realize you're doing Grand Theft 4 it's gonna do something. And if you thought you should get more than a hundred grand, you should have negotiated for more than a hundred grand before you signed the contract. Here's the thing is that he got a hundred grand for it, which may not have been a lot, but the fact that it is such a huge game means that this is gonna open a lot of doors for him too. He's gonna get a lot more offers for other, at the very least, more voice acting stuff. And let's face it, you're pretty expendable when it comes to the game because most gamers really could care less if Joe Pesci is in the game or you know tommy thompson is in the game it just doesn't matter as long as the game is good unless you're danny trejo and then you're just cool and you deserve more or patrick stewart in oblivion yeah next topic facts or crap there are four facts and one crap you must tell me which one is the crap someone locks and loads their gun told you i was getting a drink <laughs> i drink from a shotgun <laughs> <laughs> I pour the drink into the end where the bullets go. Number one, Peter Molnew, game designing guru, maker of Fable, Fable 2. And he also made older games too, like Dungeon Keeper, Syndicate, and Populous. However, the first game he ever made, Entrepreneur, only sold two copies. Not much of an entrepreneur then. <laughs> Touché. Number two. So lots of talk of Mortal Kombat recently. And the big thing with Mortal Kombat is the violence, fatalities, and babalities. In fact, Mortal Kombat was the first game to receive a parental advisory disclaimer when it was released in the arcades. Number three. Bungie Studios, makers of all things Halo. However, in their past, they made other games as well. One such game was a multiplayer-only game for the Macintosh. It was a dungeon crawler called Minotaur, the Labyrinths of Crete. Number four. Everyone's favorite old Nintendo Contra code, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. Generally, we associate that code with Contra. Well, that was not the first game to use the Konami code. Actually, the first game was a port of the game Gradius for the Nintendo. And finally, number five, the Oregon Trail, everyone's favorite edutainment game, is making a comeback. There's a version being made for cell phones. Ugh. Now, four of those are true, one of those is false. So which one is the crap? And we will start with, as always, Ivan. This is a tough one. So going down the list, I believe Peter Molyneux probably created a game that only sold two copies, probably for some silly reason, like he sold it to two of his friends or something like that. Bungie used to be a big Mac developer. They did Marathon. And since I don't know an awful lot about Mac stuff, I believe they could have done a multiplayer only Minotaur type thing. Konami code... I believe that one. In Oregon Trail, wouldn't surprise me some jackholes making something. People still insist that the cell phone is a viable platform for games, and I don't know what to think about that, but I don't know how far that's ever going to go. So I'm going to go with Mortal Kombat. I believe there was another game before Mortal Kombat that had a parental advisory label slapped on it. And... Keith? The Minotaurs of Crete. Well, I don't think it was only on Mac, is what I'm going to say for my reasoning. And finally, Tom. Normally, I would pick the first one, Peter Malnu only selling two copies, but that's really hard to sell only two. Like, if you really want to sell something, only selling two of them has to be really tough, right? And that's why Except I think that it was something strange, like he developed it and never told anyone and sold it to two friends or something goofy. Well, I'm not picking it only because I don't know how sound my reasoning is here, but it's because it's the first option in the factor crap. And what was the chance that Chad would put the false one as first? <laughs> so I'm saying that's not it. I do know that is a logic. stretch. I like that. That's a whole new approach to figuring out what it is. I like it, though. Kudos on your logic. I'm going to go with the Contra Code one because that's the one that I have no idea on, so I'll say that one's the crap. And you keep calling it the Contra Code. It's the Konami Code. Konami Code. I'm sorry. See? That's how little I know about it. I keep mispronouncing it. The answer, 
Congratulations, Ivan. Yes, Mortal Woo-hoo. Kombat was not the first game to use the parental advisory code. Splatterhouse. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, that was a great game. Yeah, it was. Peter Molyneux's entrepreneur did sell only two copies. He basically self-published the game. I don't think he had the knowledge of how to sell it correctly. Kind of the upside to all this was that since that commercially tanked in like 82 or 83, he went off and made some money. And with that money, he was able to found Bullfrog Studios and go off and make Populous Dungeon Keeper. A Bungie Studio did make a multiplayer-only dungeon crawler for the Mac called Minotaur Labyrinths of Crete. Uh, yes, the Konami code was first used in Gradius before Contra. And yes, Oregon Trail is coming back. Gamesloft is making a mobile phone versions of it. Hey. That's so dumb. The mobile phone is not a viable gaming device. Congratulations, Chad. That was a very good factor crap. You stumped me yet again, but dude, the rock can outsmart me, so kudos to you. Did you say a rock or the rock? Yeah, either and- or. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure both of them could get me in the long run. Next topic. Mailbag, mailbag, mailbag! Mailbag! Mailbag. Hello, this is Naruto20 from GCN Forums. Why are you guys so awesome? You guys are so funny. Whenever I listen on a bus, I get in trouble because everyone just looks at me awkward and everyone asks me, what are you listening to? Oh, uh, no, nothing. Just listen to llamas. Thank you. Goodbye. Why would you be embarrassed? Don't be embarrassed. You're cool if you tell everyone that you listen to the video game show. All your friends will be envious. Hey, video game show. It's uh, Frankie and Nick from Spokane. I was just... Uh, Wondering if we could be on the show sometime. So, if you ever wanted to have us on the show, our uh, Skype names. Mine is one two three four five six seven eight nine one without any spaces, and my cousin is twenty one without any spaces or capitals. Thank you. Goodbye. I gotta give the kid credit. He was very articulate for being a young kid, and that's not even making fun of him. Like most little kids that can call in are umming and on. Uh, 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 uh. He's very articulate for a kid. I love his screen names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do you mean? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine's taken. Now what do I do? <laughs> I know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can do something with him. Maybe for the next factor crap, I'll send him the uh, statements so he can read them off. I uh, would be game with that because the kid was very articulate. Let's do the mail here because I know Ivan had a similar thing on this mail question. Hey, this is Poetic Soul 44, and I just want to start by saying the show is awesome. Because of you guys, I ended up getting a 360 and am about to upgrade my computer. Since my purchase of the 360, I have played a limited amount of games. I enjoyed playing Rainbow Six Vegas 2 split-screen co-op with my friend. Which split-screen co-op games would you suggest? Thanks. Now, I know Ivan here had something similar. He didn't want split-screen co-op, but you also wanted co-op games. I was looking for four-player local co-op on the same screen. So something like Marvel Ultimate Alliance. So a not split-screen co-op game. I didn't buy a 40-inch TV so that I could play split-screen games and play on 10 inches of my TV. I like the single-screen thing. Uh, Before we hop into that, can we suggest any split-screen co-op games for the emailer he's looking for split screen so uh rainbow six is really good gears of war is obviously amazingly fun dynasty warriors is always fun i know kanan lynch never was good in terms of a single player campaign but i think the multiplayer co-op campaign was good it was only for local play i know halos are very good split screen i always have fun playing the split screen halo now on to ivan's problem of non split screen co-op games there's very very few games that fit this category lego star wars is awesome but that's only two player so there's marvel ultimate alliance is one i couldn't really find anything else other than some xbox live arcade games apparently there was a ton of them for the original xbox because yeah, i found there was the hunters there was the balder gates the x-men games there yep. was gone and then somebody in the forum suggested Dungeons and Dragons Heroes. Part of the problem is the X-Men games are really fun, but neither of the X-Men games that came out for the Xbox are backwards compatible. So the Dungeons and Dragons is my first choice, and then failing that, the Gauntlet game is downloadable from the marketplace. Were you against, like, the Turtles game? The Brawler? The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game? I'm looking for something more... Like all those ones we mentioned, Marvel Ultimate Alliance. I'm not looking for just kind of button masher co-op. If anyone else can think of a good Xbox 360 four-player same-screen co-op game, 
specifically something along the role-playing aspect like Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Send us a mail at the mailbag and give us a suggestion. Next topic. I wanted to address this last time, but I forgot. I'm not actually wishing that Brett Favre gets seriously hurt. I just think it would be funny if he did get hurt. Not wishing that the guy gets killed, but if he does break an arm or something, I think that would be hysterical. And it would only be funny, not for the fact that he broke his arm, but it would only be funny because it would continue the Madden curse. Exactly. Poor Keith caught some hell saying, why the hell would you ever wish somebody harm like that? You know what? If it's entertaining, I wish harm on my friends. I mean... <laughs> It's funny when someone hurts themselves, as long as they're not seriously injured. And actually, the closer to seriously injured you get, the funnier it is. The closer you approach seriously injured without ever actually being seriously exactly. injured. The closer the sword comes to cutting off the arm, yet not cutting it off. Well, you know what? If there's a cutting and sword involved, that's probably not going to be funny any way you slice it. Unless he was <laughs> <laughs> Any way you slice it, oh, that's good. Geez. Come on, that was pretty quick and witty. But um, unless you're juggling them, that's... That's really not going to be that funny. And if you're juggling swords and you cut your arm off, I don't care if it's a serious injury or not. That's funny. And that was Video Game Show episode number 91 for Sunday, May 25th, 2008. Any ham sandwiches or shared dream pies to give to the world peoples? Ham sandwich to our veterans. Yes, all veterans. Let us remember them. On Memorial Day, yes, that's what it is. You remember them on Memorial Day. <laughs> don't remember them today. Wait till tomorrow. I'll give a ham sandwich over to, I don't know many people who know this, a member of our forums, Sander Scamper. He is a Guitar Hero playing freak. And I guess this last week, he lives down in Australia and goes to college down there. And won attorney at school. He won attorney at school. He won some money for being a Guitar Hero god. So, ham sandwich, sir. Nice job. Who says that video games amount to nothing? I'd like to give a, a, a Shattered Dream pie to Tom's car dealership that won't haggle with him because he shows up on a bus. <laughs> uh, yes, that's the first rule of buying a car. Don't roll up to the dealership in a bus. <laughs> I had one, um, although I don't really know how to do it. So some very Usually nice. Say, I'd like to give a ham sandwich to insert name uh, here with explanation. Ah, see, therein lies the problem. So let me explain to you what's going on. A fine young gentleman contacted me yesterday while I was on Xbox Live waiting for Mary to show up so that we could go to the Indians game and said that he was a big fan. He's downloaded and listened to every one of our shows. We had a nice little conversation. He was on Windows Live Messenger, so he didn't have a gamer tag. And his Live Messenger ID is something goofy like C equals zero, tear off the alien's arm and make him eat it while his children watch LOL. So wow, dude. <laughs> Don't know if that's his actual contact name. I'm He's looking for C equals tear off the alien's arm and make him eat it while his children watch. <laughs> Lol. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, whatever your actual contact name is, Ham Sanders to you. You're a very nice young man. Thank you for listening to the show. Quick reminder about the GamerCast Network Gaming Nights. This Friday night, they're going to be playing Call of Duty 2. Check out the GamerCast Network forums at www.gamercastnetwork.com slash forums for all the details. And as always, send your comments, questions, queries, concerns, or roll call question to the mailbag at mailbag at videogameshow.org, Skype us at Video Game Show, or call us at 320-300-GAME. That is a standard long distance call and all normal fees apply. That's a wrap. Good night. All right, so let's run through them for me again there, uh, Captain List. I'm going through it real quick because I have it right in front of me. Bungie Excellent. made a multiplayer-only game for the Mac called Minotaur Lab Labyrinths of Crete. Laborates. Minotaur Labor Labyrinth. Lab Labyrinth. Labyrinths. Labyrinths of Crete. I misspelled <laughs> it so badly that I couldn't read what I typed. <laughs> you should see how I spelled entrepreneur. <laughs>